Okay, I'm pleased to introduce the folks from Gorbit Design who are here today. Uh, Gorbit Design is made up of artists and designers who enhance people's experiences of public spaces through the creative applications of technology. They've got installations in retail stores, in museums, in hotels. Um, we've got three people here. Uh, Matt has a degree in architecture and a master's from the MIT Media Lab. Before starting Gorbit Design, he's worked in Silicon Valley at Xerox Park, uh, among other places, and he has had exhibited art, technology artwork at a variety of places, including Burning Man. Um, Susan's degrees are in computer science and psychology. She also lived in the Valley for years, working at places like SGI, where she did interactive TV user interface design. She worked with Vermal for a while, um, was the director of user experience at Excited Home in Snapfish. Uh, Susan and Matt are both on the faculty at the Canadian Film Center's Interactive Art and Entertainment Program. Rob is a professor of mechatronic engineering at the University of Waterloo, uh, where he holds his PhD in electrical engineering. Um, they're going to talk about, well, I'll let them decide what they're going to talk about. Um, just one more note, this talk is going to go up on Google Video, so the request is save questions for the end because it just makes it much easier uh, in the video later. So here we are. Thank you very much and thanks for having us here. It's really good to be back uh, here. And um, we're going to talk today about uh, some of the design principles and practices that we bring to our um, design practice. And we, we um, you can see on this slide, the title of our talk is People as Medium. And when we're working, um, creating installations, whether for uh, commercial clients or for public artworks, we approach the work that we do thinking of the people who are going to experience our work really as part of our medium. So going beyond uh, just a simple participant or a user or a viewer, we like to um, think about who's the people who are going to be um, using it as integral so that the piece doesn't really exist if the person is not using it in that sense. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about the, the, the principles that we bring to bear on this and we're going to wrap that around some of the projects that we've done to illustrate. So starting off, this is a project that uh, some of you will, find, will be familiar with. Um, it's a piece that uh, I was involved with when I was working with Xerox Park called Tilty Tables and it was part of a larger um, project called Experiments in the Future of Reading that was shown in San Jose at the San Jose Tech Museum. And what we were doing is playing with different ways to experience information, different ways to experience the user interface and the ability to browse and search through very large, uh, well, maybe not very large, but lar uh, large documents. So in this case, we're looking at a table that's three feet by three feet. Projected down onto it is information. And the interface to this, to this document that these kids are looking at right now is just by tilting the table. So as you tilt the table, we take advantage of uh, people's familiarity with, with gravity and with the way the world works to do something that just makes sense, which is you tilt the table in one direction, the information flows in that direction. You tilt the table in another direction, the information flows in that direction. So experiments like this where we're starting to play with um, people's preconceived notions of how the world works and bringing that to bear on the information world so we can break out of our sort of traditional uh, keyboard mouse monitor, um, monitor paradigms. And another piece that we did for that show is this one called The Reading Wall, which I'll show a quick video of as well. The Reading Wall is a, um, it's three 16-foot walls. Let's see if we can get that to play a little better. And on the walls are um, plasma monitors. Back up. Try playing the video. That doesn't look like it's going to play for some reason. So on these walls are these plasma screens. And there is information printed on the walls, but also information on the screens. And the information on the screens is dynamic, um, changing in the context of a museum, when you put dynamic changing uh, information on a screen, often it gets lost because of the way people visit uh, a museum and the way, um, the sort of the context in which people will experience it. If you walk up to a screen and you see things changing, you don't necessarily know where you are in the stream of the video, right? But in this case, what we did was we synchronized the uh, movement on the screen to the movement, the physical position of the screen on the wall. So as people move the screen from the left-hand side, across to the right-hand side, you move through the story. And we like to think of that interface a lot like um, the interface that you have when you're reading a book. So you pick up the book and you can flip through the pages. You can move forward, you can move backward, you can move at whatever pace you like. You can go quickly, you can go slowly. And again, and again, playing on what people know and what people know of the world that they inhabit and what they're used to. 
um, and tying it directly to a physical uh, to a physical sense of the world. Although now it's playing, of course. Um, so you can see just very quickly, I won't show the whole video now that I've already talked about it. But you can see as, as you move and if you stop, and if you go forward, if you go backward, if you go quickly or if you go slowly, the dynamic text that's printed on these screens and that's synchronized with the uh, wall behind it uh, moves at the same pace as the viewer. So again, connecting it right back to the, to the person's body and embodiment. Um, so this principle, when we think about this, we call it talk to the hindbrain. When we make designs, we like to think about dealing with people's uh, brains and not necessarily presenting them with a lot of information that they have to cogitate about, right? You don't want to have instructions. You don't want to have um, mappings of click here and slide this and first do this and then do that. But really, can you talk to people on a level that, that is the subconscious brain and the brain that we're sort of used to dealing with in the real world and in the embodied world? And that's sort of this first principle that we bring to our work. Well, um, yeah, sure. Uh, just, it's just that we, we all spend many, many, many years learning about the physical world and understanding how the physical world works and, and how moving things and how gravity works and, and, and getting there. And when you are in a purely digital world, sometimes you're, you're very disconnected from all of that learning and knowledge. So taking things back into a tangible interface that people can sort of approach and, and use their, their physical bodies to interact with and, and understand sort of gets back into this sort of visceral way in which we really experience the world around us and uses the digital information as an enhancement to that experience rather than than as rather than taking away from that experience um, so another example of this that um, of, of using this uh, sort of our, our bodily senses is um, a concept called ambient media which is explored at the at the MIT, MIT media lab and also at Xerox Park um, and a lot of um, sort of attention has been paid to this idea of taking information and putting it into our environments. This piece is a piece that we did exploring that concept for Herman Miller. Um, they launched a, a uh, line of furniture in, in 2000 called Herman Miller Red. And it was a line of sort of um, very designed furniture but aimed at fast moving, fast growing companies. Um, it was sold online. It was, they created a, um, an e-commerce e site where they were selling this furniture. They got a lot of really good reviews. It was very successful. And then they opened up a store, a showroom, a physical showroom in uh, Manhattan. And they commissioned this piece, which is sort of a, an information artwork that serves both as decor in their space, but also as a way of monitoring in this very ambient way the activity that's occurring uh, on their website. So I'm going to uh, just launch a quick demo of what we created for them. So what we did for the installation was a custom screen that took um, the shape of their logo, which was this uh, sort of screen base, screen shape that you see here. And it, um, let me just make sure it's running here, once again. And then we connected that to their back end of their server to take the, um, the real-time data of the traffic hitting their website. And we could represent that graphically in the store in very large on this 10-foot screen. So what you'll see on here is a little bit, it's a little bit like an ecosystem of what was happening as people would arrive on their site and surf around the various pages of their site. These little black dots that you see are the number of dots is sort of tied to the number of visitors that they have. The frequency with which the dots slide around is tied to the frequency of page requests. And then um, the system is constantly sort of adjusting to how much information or how much data it has by zooming in, zooming out, and just giving, trying to give a visceral sense for is there, are there a lot of people here or not that many people here. And when you see a slideshow like this of uh, product, that represented a purchase. So when somebody made a purchase, you would see the, pur the purchased items that they had just bought and you would see it just uh, dynamically in real time. There's like an eight minute delay because we were processing the data and bringing it down in chunks. And the system did a few other things just to, just to reinforce this idea that the data is there, but it's not um, you know, literal data on a spreadsheet. What we would do is uh, we would, every once in a while throughout the course of the day, we would change the color and cycle through the colors that, that uh, they had in their sort of branding. We would move through the five different colors that they 
had to try to put like little landmarks in the course of the day so that the people who are working in the store, who are actually the same people who are running the website, they would be able to say, oh, you know what, it's really funny that that thing is always kind of very quiet when it's yellow, which is mapped to, you know, in the mid-afternoon after lunch, nobody's ever on our site. But we got a lot of traffic when it's green in the morning, and maybe we should change the way we do things in that sense. So trying to take these notions from the physical world and move them into, um, into something that's really displaying um, techno technological uh, data-driven um, information. So. Um, part of this came from the idea that when you have a physical store, you're very aware of the traffic in and out of the store. You can see, oh, people like these products over here, they don't like those products over here. And that's very different than seeing a spreadsheet at the end of the week. You get a, a more visceral sense for what's happening. And so this, again, the, the idea of ambient media is not to replace that spreadsheet because that's interesting and important too, but, but again, to, to sort of add to it, to provide that, that visceral human sense for or knowing what's happening, what's, go what's going on at sort of some um, level that's not about the numbers. Thinking about it as sort of a, a window onto your data, so you can always check the weather. Um, like we know what time of day it is outside, not by necessarily looking at our watches, but by having a peripheral sense for what the data is like, what's happening outside. And those humans are pretty good at those peripheral senses, and so this is about that. So um, this piece brings up a second point uh, that we like to, that we tend to bring to our work, which is this idea of focusing on the intent or focusing on the goals. And in this case, um, the intent was all about this uh, bridge between their, their uh, business, which was a successful business running in the virtual world, and this new thing they were doing about the physical world. So we started with the premise that there is a problem to be solved here. So though we create something that we call artwork, it all starts in a sort of a design, with a design goal, and trying to solve that design goal, or at least address the goals of the space, or the goals of our clients. Mm -hmm. um, um, sure. Okay, so the, the next piece, um, pieces I'll talk about are at a space um, that's the Drake Hotel in Toronto. The, the Drake is a very interesting space. Um, it's in an area of town that is sort of on the rise, um, was very run down and is, and is getting there. Um, just to give you an idea, they, they bought the building for $800,000 and then spent $6 million renovating it. So the, 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 but it was, a, it was an old sort of flop house b before the renovation was done. And the owner of the hotel really wanted to keep that sort of sense of history, sense of neighborhood. There were murals painted on the walls that were, were 50 years old and, and trying to kind of, um, unlike a usual hotel where, where you wipe everything clean every night and pretend that nobody else has ever stayed here, he wanted to have a sense of the community in there because the, the space is actually, there are only 20 hotel rooms and the rest of it is, it's more about the public spaces than it is about the hotel rooms. So the materials that were chosen by the architects are also all about showing the community impact over time. Like the, the, the bar is painted with black over red so it will get scuffs as people kick it and they'll be visible and things, materials that would rust, um, stuff like that. So. So we took a look at this building and his goals in terms of the community and created two pieces that are an exploration of what would happen if the building was aware of its inhabitants and could poke a little bit of that awareness out of the walls so we could see it. So um, this first piece I'll talk about is, is threshold memory. Um, it's, it's in the doorway. It's sort of inset into the fire door that is between the main lobby and the sort of main lounge restaurant. And many, many people who go into the hotel um, pass through that doorway to get where they're going. And it's a series of Nixie tubes, which are very old technology, but we, and, and we thought that the sort of gentle tech feeling was very appropriate to this space, that sort of old tech. Um, they all started at zero the day the Drake opened, and every time someone comes through the door from the lobby into the lounge, not the other direction, um, the, the lower digit counts up by one. So it's been going up ever since the Drake opened. Um, now it's, it's at just about a million now, um, and it, it will, it, it'll count for 300 years before it turns over. So it never goes down, it never changes, even if the power goes out, it saves its, its count. And so the idea is that people are leaving a little bit of themselves in the Drake. It's creating a little bit of a monument to the community of the Drake, and, and something that you can look at and say, oh wow, that was only down at, 600,000 last time I was here, and it, and it sort of, 
it really interesting to see it um, go up over time. Right, so if that's the memory, then this is the heartbeat of the Drake. Um, and it's on a wall that's in the back lobby of the Drake and, and physically in the direct center of the floor plan of the building. And these um, six gauges are tied to the six public areas in the hotel. So there's a sky yard and a, and a um, basement um, room and a restaurant and a lounge and a cafe. And, they are showing the activity levels by showing the sound levels in each of those spaces. So you can sort of come up to this and say, where's the party? Or where can we have a quiet conversation? What's going on here? And it, and it really does give you a sense of the pulse of the Drake right now in time. And, and we see people use it that way, sort of go, um, come up and say, is anything going on in the underground right now? And, and you can really tell by looking at it, um, what's happening. So one of the things about, about these two pieces um, is that they're very, very subtle. Um, they're, they're designed to be a part of the architecture and sort of a part of the, uh, done with the materials that the building is made out of. So rather than being like art that's hung on the wall, they don't even have plaques that explain what they are. And part of the intent there is that you can go to this building many, many times without even necessarily noticing them. But once you do notice them, and once you find out what they are and how they work, then you know something. You have something that, that so a little bit of knowledge that has come to you about something special in this space. And people's uh, tendency, once they have some, an experience like that, is to want to share it. So what we get is we get this uh, third concept that we play with called social currency, where when somebody has had an experience that's unique and surprising and fun, then they call their friend over and they say, look at this thing, come on over here. Look at these, okay, walk through this door. And then they, their friend walks through the door, and by doing that and having that interaction with their friend, they've now kind of shared a little bit of their own sort of pride of the space. And for a client who's got a space that they want to make kind of hip and they want to make people feel good about, offering something where people can kind of internalize a little bit of that kind of pride or that extra knowledge of that, oh, I'm special because I know something about this and now I can share it with my friends, is something that we've actually played with uh, to, to a great degree with a lot of our work. And we see people doing that um, and, and taking these little bits and nuggets of interaction and bringing them, sharing them with their friends. And it's something that, we're, that we use when we're talking to clients about the advantages to this sort of work in their, uh, in their, in their spaces. And I think another one, yeah. well, you can see so, um, so here's another example uh, of that principle a little bit. This, this is uh, created for a store also in Toronto that's in the distillery district in Toronto, which is a sort of revitalized old cobblestone brick building area that has been turned into a space of art galleries and retail shops. And the store is Lileo, um, comes from Galileo, and they're, they're their world is, uh, their branding is all about light and discovery. Um, it's sort of a high-end fashion sporting goods store. Um, $300 Pumas, I've never bought anything there. <laughs> so it's, um, but they were looking for something that would sort of, sort of fill the same function that a fountain fills in a space. They had um, had a fountain in, a, in another store they were looking at, but they also wanted something with an extra sense of uniqueness and wow that would sort of be con contemplative and would also pull people in to, to see it. So um, we created the Lilea Light Fountain. It's a large, dark steel table, slightly curved, um, seven feet across, with three um, on, a, on a wood base, and the wood is created from the recycled wood that the rest of the store is also um, created from that comes from the old distillery. And then three stones on the surface of the table. And these patterns of light play in and around the stones and circle them. And if you reach in and move a stone, then the light flows and changes based on the movement. It's, it's finding the stones. Um, So there's an example. So it will also respond to people's hands or if they, you know, toss a, a you know, large shiny wallet or something in there. Um, and what we find happens is that people see it from a distance and they say, oh, that's nice. And then they see the patterns of light and they say, ooh, that's interesting. And then they, they are invited to or, or they move a stone and they go, wow. You know, there's this sort of frisson, that's magic, it responded to me, you know, and, and then the next thing they do is they say, hey, hey, come, 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 come. 
move a stone. You know, and there's that little bit of, of, and that's the social currency. And it's also like this feeling of initiating someone else into the magic. You know, you've felt it and now you want to share it with everybody else. And so that, that feeling, that, that frisson, you know, it gets people past the, I mean, even, even the people who, um, the salespeople in the store, they don't have the sort of normal interaction with the customers. How can I help you? You know, they say, would you like to play with the fountain? <laughs> you know, and they're they're sort of so beyond that, and 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 into a, an interaction that's that's at a at a much more real level. Um, one of the the things to notice about this piece, I mean, one of the things people always sort of say, "How did you do that?" You know, well, we trained the light very carefully. You know, it's all that. Um, but but one of the important things to us about this piece is also that the technology, um, the delicate stuff, is all up in the ceiling. What's down here that that people are touching is stone, steel, and wood. You know, you can climb on the thing, in fact, people have. You can bang on it, you know, until the cows come home and you're not going to hurt it because, because it, you know, everything that's delicate is way away. And, and that, when you're putting something in a retail space that's going to be banged on, the, thinking through those issues is really, really important. That um, to sort of the next, I think that sort of brings us to the next um, of our principles here, which is that uh, we, we treat, all of our work uses technology, but we really treat technology as a means to an end. So where a lot of interactive artwork or artwork that uses technology is about the technology itself, if you take the other principles we've been talking about, like focusing on, on, on intent and really speaking to the user at a low level, then you can build an end that you're trying to achieve and then pick appropriate technology, whether it's 1960s Nixie tubes or uh, state-of-the-art you know, vision tracking software or whatever. But it's really not about the technology. And in fact, most of the people who use the Laleo light fountain never even realize that it's just a standard DLP projector stuck in the ceiling. They think it's something really magical because of the um, context in which they experience it. So this, uh, this is sort of the, the fourth of our, of our points. And I guess it leads into the next uh, piece that we're talking about. So. <laughs> um, this is. Um, this is our the most recent uh, piece that Gorbit Design is currently working on. Um, it's still a project in the works. Um, it's a commission for a large-scale outdoor permanent dynamic sculpture for the region of Cambridge in uh, Ontario, west of Toronto. And the reason for the commission of this piece was uh, in response to the construction of a new, uh, by the region, of a new emergency medical services facility. And this this building is. Uh, one of the first leeds rated gold leeds rated buildings in north america so this is an environmental standard and they're using this novel solar technology that is made by a, a local company called spheral solar the aspect of the technology that's interesting is that it's it's flexible so it's a laminate um, that you can put onto building materials or cut in shapes etc um, and they wanted to commission a piece that responded to this in sense of envi the environment and that used this, this new solar technology. And so in approaching the design of this piece, again, thinking about the intent, thinking about the location, uh, we spent a lot of time brainstorming over what is an emergency medical services facility, um, what, is, what does it mean to have solar energy, et cetera. And we, we, um, worked with this form that is the these 12 shafts and the they go from the longest shaft which is 30 feet long six inch square structural steel and coming out at a, at a 67 degree angle and sweeping around in a very graceful arc that follows a sine curve down to a, a shaft that's 18 feet long at an angle of something like 21 degrees uh, and the reason for these angles and for these these um, lengths is related to the whole solar aspect. So in the summertime, if you're installing a solar panel, what you'd really like is for the solar panel to be angled perpendicular to the sun. And so in the summertime, that means very low, and it means you've got more hours of sunlight, so you need less area in order to capture the same amount of energy. In the wintertime, the sun is low in the sky, so the angle is very high, and you need correspondingly longer. And it turns out that because of the path the sun follows through the sky, just mathematically, these turn into very beautiful forms. Um, and so this, are you going you gonna to play that? Sure. So Matt's going to show you a, a fly through that was done in SketchUp, um, if, if it plays. We love SketchUp. Last time it took three times to make it play, so we'll just 
you just keep trying. Um, so the idea of the sculpture is that each shaft is an independent piece of electronics that collects energy during, this, during the day from these um, novel solar cells that are on the south facing uh, sides of the shafts, collects energy into its own battery. There's its uh, uh, individual microcontrollers in each of the shafts. And at dusk, the sculpture comes alive with a, a light show that plays across the surface of the 12 shafts. Um, we'll see in a minute that on each shaft there are three groups of three lamps. These are LED lamps that are distributed, and you'll see them as we zoom in here. One of the interesting things about this site is that there, there, are, there is no pedestrian traffic. It's all cars, trucks, it's a very industrial space. So they've commissioned a piece of public art for a space that's not really seen by a whole heck of a lot of public. And so that was one of the things that we really looked at when we were um, trying to decide what was important about this piece. And one of our guiding principles became public art should be public. Um, so we really thought hard about how to do that and um, wound up thinking about interactivity at a distance and interactivity o over the web um, for this kind of piece. And Rob will talk in a second about how that works. But um, So you're seeing it uh, as, as you would from a car sort of driving by. Well, then we take off into an airplane but, but <laughs> and then fly. But, 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 but driving by, um, we wanted the, the forms, the, although the shafts don't move, the form is very dynamic if you're moving by it in a car because they, they, they blend against each other. Um, and that was something that was important to us too, that even the daytime aspect of the piece hints at its dynamism and, and activity. So. And so um, you can see from this mock-up that each of the shafts has uh, lights inset along the length and there are actually three groups of three lamps in each shaft. And the number three essentially because that's the minimum required to give a sense of, of movement, of, of direction. Um, and users will log on to a website and interact with the piece in this, uh, using this interface. Um, where again, we're essentially going back to sine waves. There's basically a sine wave that plays across the X and Y directions of this, this set of shafts. And the user can control the frequency and the relative phase between the sine waves. Um, as well as a, a randomness, which we call scatter. And the flare control, which controls the, um, the relative phase inside each of the groups, smaller groups of three. So you can get this sort of flaring uh, movement as well. Um, and the way we think about this is that people will uh, log in and, and uh, put a little bit of themselves into the piece. It's a, it's a bit like composing. You know, it's a kind of a light composition tool. Uh, when they submit their designs, it goes into a queue that gets played that evening. And over the course of time, we will aggregate the data so that the, um, and at the end of the show, in, in a given evening, uh, once individual designs have been played, the piece will revert to a kind of aggregate that represents all of the different contributions of the community. So it really becomes a community piece. We'll go next. <laughs> so um, this ties back into this idea that, that we talked about with L Lileo and again with this one. Um, this, it's kind of, oh wow, I can do this. I can control this, this um, piece of sculpture. I can have my impact on, on the landscape. And so the last of the, of, the, of, the, um, of, the of the principles is one of the most important ones that we talk about is this idea of surprise and delight. And if we can bring surprise and delight to people in an experience that they're, um, that they're going to have, then, then, we've, then we've succeeded. And I think the last piece we're going to talk about is um, maybe the best illustration of that. So the last piece is the one um, that is currently on, on display or on exhibit at uh, Zero One Festival down in San Jose on the south wall of the, is it McHenry? Yeah. McHenry Convention Center. Um, this was a piece that was developed in 2002 in response to a public call for um, a con contemporary art forum where the theme was power to the people. And so Matt and Susan and I sat down and we sort of brainstormed what, is it, what does power, what does giving power to people mean? Um, and the theme was chosen in, it, the, the festival takes place in the city called Kitchener in, the, in, what, in uh, southwestern Ontario. 
And the theme was chosen because that year, 2002, was the 100th anniversary of the introduction of public power into that area. Um, and so we came up with this idea of taking the kind of iconic tool of corporate communication, the marquee, and combining it with the ubiquitous um, symbol of the, the light switch and the light bulb. Everybody knows that interface, and so this is again talking to the hindbrain. Um, and creating this marquee that we would put on the face of City Hall for 10 days, 24-7, that anybody could come up and flip switches and put their, their message up onto City Hall. Um, this is another piece where uh, surprise and delight is great. Kids come up and they're, oh, daddy, daddy, can I put my name on City Hall? Can I please put my name on City Hall? And uh, you get an incredible cross-section of responses from different cross-sections of people. Um, so we have the kids playing with it. We have uh, adolescents playing with it, putting up messages of, of love or, you know, Jake loves Sarah and, and I love you. And um, you get the street kids playing with it, putting up other kinds of messages. Um, do we have punks? Um, we get the, the nightlife playing with it. Um, and all of these different sort of classes and, and cross sections of the population come and they contribute their own little piece to um, the experience of, of the work. And um, the other aspect of this is that we've redone it in 2004 in Toronto on the, on the front of the Drake Hotel, in fact. Um, so again, this is a different context. Now we're in a, a, an urban center on a hip street. It's no longer a public building, it's a private building. Um, and the population is different. Uh, and so instead of seeing the same kinds of messages that we saw with in Kitchener, we see much more thought out, much more profound kinds of messages. People being a lot more clever. People, yeah. Um, have, you, have you got ego? Yeah, there it is. Um, so this is a, a Friday night in, in the Drake Hotel and there are lines of people waiting to get in and somebody, you know, put ego with a big arrow pointing down to the line. Um, so there's sort of much more um, profound messaging going on. Again, this piece is, is one where the technology is invisible. Um, in, through two showings, both in Toronto and in Kitchener, we had very, very few people wonder how it worked, um, which, which I find amazing. I mean, that, that, that's our intent. Um, but I still find it pretty amazing um, because we're obviously not switching 120 volts with, with regular light switches out on the, on the street side. Um, you know, this, it rains on this thing, so that wouldn't be good. Um, but it doesn't matter. But it didn't matter to the people. In fact, there's a really good story. Can I tell this? Yeah. Um, there's a really good story about when we showed it in Toronto because when we showed it in Kitchener, it was a wired piece. So there was a, a serial cable that essentially ran from the switch panel 500 feet up to the display. Um, when we showed it in Toronto, we were having a lot of trouble getting permits to run that cable over Queen Street, which is where streetcars run. We were also quite concerned about electrical noise from the streetcar passing underneath. And so we decided to do it wireless. Um, Matt was negotiating with the people from the city to get uh, this permit. And, you know, they had put us through, you know, you need to talk to this person and that person. And he was still sort of working on it when we made the decision to go wireless. And I guess we never, you know, we never told him that we were going to go wireless. Um, and what we did with the, with the piece was we took the um, conduit that we had used in Kitchener to run the cable and we stuck it to the side of the, of the switch panel and we put it in a hole that happened to be in the parking lot. So you have this, this image, you know, so that it satisfies people's kind of need to understand that there's something there. Um, and Matt got this frantic phone call one day during the show from the guy at, from the city um, and he said, uh, he said, uh, well, uh, congratulations. It looks like you have your piece up. And, uh, uh, well, I notice you've done something underground. And I'm, I'm really not sure that we issued a permit for that, is what he said. And, uh, yeah, so this just, this just speaks again to people's perceptions and kind of, um, in, this, in this case, we, went a we did a little bit too good in trying to satisfy what they were expecting to see from the piece. Um. Just to say something else about it, sort of being being up and around for that long. One one of the things that we've been um, really interested to find is that when we first put the piece up in Kitchener, we were really kind of nervous about it getting vandalized because here it is, this big gray thing, looks like a perfect place to tag, and and it's just plywood and switches, and is it going to be too delicate? And and we we it was up and it was up and everything was fine, and we started talking to some of the folks that were hanging out down there 24 hours a day, and and we said, you know, is this something which 
just, they said, no, man, this is the greatest thing that ever happened. Are you kidding? If someone hurts it, I'll break their kneecaps. You know, they, they, they got feeling really protective and possessive of it. And, and the same thing had then happened in Toronto. It was up for a month, 24 hours a day, out on this city street in the middle of, you know, downtown. And, and the taggers would tag the bus stop that was right next to it. But we would go by at 2 in the morning. So there was this one guy that was filth right up on the, on the bus stop, and we'd see filth up in the lights. And, and, and to us, you know, that, that's what it means. It's doing what, what we sort of intended from the beginning, which is, which is that, you know, we normally get bombarded by images in an urban environment, McDonald's and whatever, all the, the advertising, and we don't have the, that kind of power to, to change the urban environment in any way. And so this sort of gives people the power that they're not, that, that the vandalism is an expression of not having. Um, and so, so it sort of allows people to do that. And I mean, one thing that's important to us about this piece is that it's not a statement, it's not so much a statement about free speech as it's a question. Because we feel like it's really important to ask the questions about what is appropriate public free speech. It's very important to us too that it's not anonymous. If you can see it, you can change it. You're standing there flipping switches. I mean, you can run away, but <laughs> but if you're you're not sort of sending something in over the web or 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 any of that, you're 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 actually physically there, and so you have to take some amount of ownership over what you're putting up and what you're doing, um, and and that that creates an interesting dynamic. Um, sometimes we talk about social grease. It takes the dynamics. It doesn't really change what people are doing, but it takes the dynamics that people already have, and puts them up big. And, and technology is often like that. We've had a number of people um, at different venues, Kitchener and Toronto, uh, when, they, when you describe the piece to them, they say, oh, and there's a keyboard and you can sort of type. And we say, no, 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 it's, it switches. And they kind of go, why? Why wouldn't you just use a keyboard? And then, and then they go and use it and they come back and they go, I get it. You know, it's, it's this ubiquitous, simple, everybody knows how to use it, um, kind of playing field leveling thing. Um, in, in Kitchener, I had an experience where, just to follow up on what Susan was saying, I had an experience where I was standing beside the piece and there was a, a, a four-letter word starting with F up on, the, up on the display. And a gentleman came up to me and he, I was wearing my little artist tag, and he said, is this what you intended? And, and I said, well, no, you know, we didn't go out to create a, a, a swear board or whatever you want to call it. Um, but if, if it offends you, one of the things about it is that the switches are right there. There was nobody standing in front of it. Um, you can feel free to, to change it. And he just kind of huffed and walked away. And it was this, the weirdest thing because here was this guy who was so comfortable and used to people censoring things for him that he wasn't even willing to go up and just kind of go like this. Um, and, and so that to me was kind of like a, a, an incredible moment. Um. So I think that's uh, sort of pretty much summarizes the uh, the the five of the of the major principles we play with uh, in our work. I'm gonna play a little bit um, a little video that we have here of uh, of that piece actually. Um, this is from Tuesday night in San Jose. And you can see people playing with it, and it's it's very different. <laughs> And we wanted to put that up there because of that. So somebody put Google up there in the middle of the night. 9.34 I don't know. Tuesday evening, someone from Google was down there. It might have been one of you guys. There you go. And thank you very much for your attention. We'd be welcome. <laughs> and we welcome any questions on um, any design principles or on the technology that we use or how we did certain things. Or whatever. You had those light poles. You sort of designed it so that the shortest pole would get um, the shortest pole would get the same amount of energy in December as the tallest pole would. No, oh, no, backwards, right? Exactly. The shortest one exactly. in yeah, you got it, yeah. Do all of them like? Does the sun produce the same amount all over the year? At, at that distance from the sun, yes. I mean, they're they're at different angles, so <laughs> they're at different angles. So, and here you see it in Google Earth. Um, there are different angles. So in the um, winter time, the tall shaft may collect more energy than the short shaft. And you're also going to get variation from clouds going over, etc. Um, and so one of the things about the piece is that shafts will die out at different times 
during the evening. So they're not, as the show goes on, they basically plays the show until the batteries run out. And so you will lose different shafts at different times. Um, and again, the, how long the show lasts is therefore another kind of reflection of the health of the community in the sense that that's how, it's reflective of how much sunlight the community got that, that day. Um, and there was something else I wanted to say about this piece, which I forgot. <laughs> But this, um, this uh, uh, Google Earth, I was thinking when we were talking about social currency, Google Earth is another area where that, I, I'm, I think that probably happens a lot. People discover things and then kind of say, hey, you know, come and see this and tag things and send their tags out. Yeah, that's true. That plays with the same concept. Right? Same idea of uh, insider knowledge or social currency. Other questions? How do you feel about the monetization of social currency with something like YouTube mm -hmm. or Google Video where you, we rely on drawing people in and then make a buck off of it? Well, in, in a sense, we, I mean, that's our business model in a way. I mean, because we do, <laughs> that's how we sell our, that's, how, that's one of the things that we use to sell our, our work, right? When we talk to clients and they say, well, why, what's in it for me? Why do I want artwork in my space? And what kind of artwork? And, and the fact that they even call it artwork is sort of, you know, sometimes we don't. Sometimes it's just design. Um, and it's, it's getting increasingly so, which, which we like. Um, but, but to be able to say that, that, you know, for someone like this retail store and their fountain, to be able to see a year later people dragging their friends in off the street into the store so that they can show them this thing and share that experience with them. And oh yes, by the way, now they're in your store and yes, they're looking around at your merchandise and yes, they may buy something is, is kind of proof, you know, in the pudding. So can't argue with monetization. <laughs> yeah, especially as artists. Um, I mean, that's one of the things that, that we, I guess, struggle with. I don't know if that's the right word, but, but this line between art and design and this question of, of what is art and what is design and where are your principles and all that sort of thing. I mean, for us, you know, we're about enhancing experience of public spaces through the creative application of technology. And one of the things that we really like to have is a strong context. You know, we talk about intent here, we talk about sort of speaking to the context. And a strong brand is, is just as interesting and strong to us as, as a site, you know, that, that has its own limitations and, and, and possibilities. So, so yeah, art, design, I, I don't know. You, you know, it, I mean, it, it's all about experience. And, and, and to tell you the truth, when you're doing something for a client, generally the resources are a little different than when you're doing something that's, that's sort of a, pub, a public art project. Um, so sometimes you can do more interesting things and, and, and in fact enhance people's experience in ways that you might not have the opportunity to in, in a, in a non-commercial environment. So, so uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> I say because I'm on film here and, I'm, and we're at Google, that Keyhole and SketchUp were my two very favorite things in the whole world, and thank you for buying them both and making them free. <laughs> well, thanks a lot.